this is a uh, <coughs> an oral history interview uh, with Noel Cook for the Robert J. Dole Institute of Politics at the University of Kansas. We're in the offices of his firm, Transicor, in Rockville, Maryland. Today is Wednesday, February 20th, 2008, and I'm Brian Williams. Well, let's start out with your first awareness of Bob Dole and then your earliest contacts with him. Uh, when I came to Washington in 1969, I was an assistant to the Postmaster General. At that time, it was Winton Blunt, and the post office itself was still in the, in the, uh, in the government, and, and he was a cabinet member. Uh, I it, probably in 69 or 70, and I don't recall the precise date, but you can figure it out from the, from the events of that period. We uh, uh, dedicated a, the Eisenhower commemorative stamp, and we flew to uh, I think Abilene for the for that for that purpose to Ike's birthplace. And the convention was at the time that you invited the senators from the state, that wherever that this applied. So we asked, uh, or Red asked, uh, uh, I think the guy's name was Pearson. I think Senator Pearson may have been the senior senator. And Bob Dole, Pearson was sick and was back in the state actually. And Bob accepted the invitation. So we flew down on the Jet Star and we got acquainted. and. Uh, uh, and that was my first awareness of him. Uh, we got uh, talking on the plane. Of course, Vietnam was still very much a hot issue, and that subject came up, and uh, that subject eventually got into the speech, which got revised on the plane as we went out there. And, uh, and I, either he asked me or, uh, or I volunteered. I don't remember exactly how it came up, but, uh, but basically it was would I, would I help him with his speeches sometime? I said, yeah. So uh, he rapidly became a, uh, a, a real uh, supporter of free speech at that time, and especially free speeches, because I wrote uh, literally hundreds of them for him. Uh, he, and after a while, very quickly, he took it for granted. Uh, he'd, he'd have one of his staffers, Ward White, call down and say, uh, uh, the senator's speaking somewhere, and uh, he wants you to write a speech for him. And, uh, and I would. And there was never any compensation, never any request for it, and never even thank you. So that was Bob Dole's way of operating. So uh, uh, in, in this period, this is now, we're in the 1970, uh, and he spoke in the campaign of 70, in the congressional, you know, the off-year election, more than anybody with the exception of, uh, of the vice president, who at the time was Spiro Agnew, uh, Bob was out there in the hustings and defending the administration, defending the war, and so on and so on, and uh, ingratiating himself with the White House. And on that account, uh, he, uh, he became chairman of the Republican National Committee. There was enormous uh, uh, opposition to that. The minority leader was uh, Hugh Scott. Uh, he didn't want it. Uh, he didn't want Bob in there. Bob had already established himself as a, as a very uh, aggressive uh, senator. Um, so he had his opponents. I thought he was too young, too uh, um, too obstreperous, uh, too rambunctious, too unseasoned. But there are other people who did support him. Uh, Barry Goldwater was one of them. He said it's about time that we had somebody who could take the opposition by the hair and drag them down the hill. So, <laughs> Quote unquote. Yeah, that's what he said, and uh, and uh, that just uh, fed Bob's uh, ambitions and, and his instincts. So uh, so he, and he became the chairman of the Republican National Committee, which was not a good thing for him actually in the long term. Let's just step back for a second. What was your role at the post office? I was assistant to the postmaster general. Which meant you were doing? Well, I principally a yeah, speechwriter. But wherever he went, I went, uh, generally. I mean, if it involved any sort of public speaking at all, uh, I mean, at one uh, point, uh, we actually set out on a uh, journey to go to Hanoi to make sure the prisoners got their Christmas mail, if you can believe that. Uh, uh, well, that's a whole other story, but that, uh, but that, that all came across in Paris when we went to meet with the North Vietnamese delegation, 
and uh, the night we got there, of uh, course there was no way we, they were going to let us do this, but, uh, but the administration had signed off on it. So when we got to uh, Paris, uh, let me give you a little little background here. Red Blunt was a very sophisticated man, a very wealthy man. Uh, uh, one of his ancestors was a signer of the Constitution, uh, and uh, uh, a very accomplished guy, a very, very great art collector, uh, uh, anophile, loved wine, understood new wine, and uh, uh, but he had one one soft spot. He just hated Charles de Gaulle. Hated him. And so he'd never been to France in his life. But for this cause, to go, you know, for the, for the, uh, to check on the POW uh, Christmas mail, he was willing to make a, make an exception. And so uh, we had to get to a start in, in Paris, which, where the peace talks were underway. And uh, so we did. We went to Paris, and when we got there, uh, they held the plane up on a runway, and somebody came out from the embassy with the big news, which was, Charles de Gaulle has died. I kind of made Red's trip, actually. So, so <laughs> but we sort of got caught up in the, the, the moil here, and uh, in preparation for a state funeral, which of course Nixon would attend, and so on and so on. So it all went fluttering, which, which inevitably it had to do anyway. So. Um, <clears throat> had you trained as a as a writer, or did you fall into that role, or in your background? How did you prepare to be providing the service? I don't think anybody prepares to be a speechwriter. I never heard of anybody doing it. Uh, you know, Ted Sorensen had a great reputation. He's a lawyer. I just uh, uh, as a as a young boy, I, I, I had a sort of a difficult childhood, and my escape was to read, and, uh, and I enjoyed trying to write poetry and, uh, and, and uh, other things. Uh, I had been in Vietnam. I was a veteran by that time. I'd been in there in the first uh, operational unit that was sent into Vietnam. And uh, I kept a journal, so I, it's, I was fairly literate. And, uh, and uh, I got involved in the campaign of, uh, in 68 because our first child had been born and I wanted to save the world. So uh, I got involved in the campaign uh, working with uh, John Eisenhower. Um, and that was interesting at the time. His, uh, his dad was in the hospital at uh, Walter Reed, never, never left it. He died in March of 69. Uh, and uh, so I wrote speeches for him. Not many, but but enough. I mean, John hated to talk. I mean, he just he was working on his first book on the, you know, the Bitter Woods, and uh, he, he didn't. Uh, he was not a great. Uh, he just didn't like going out and doing this stuff an awful lot. But when it had to be done, I'd write a speech for him, and we'd go and do it. And I met. Uh, a number of people there. Uh, one of them was a guy named Jamie Humes, who was uh, sort of a rumbustious character, who uh, who's one of his uh, one of his uh, things was uh, uh, imitating Winston Churchill. He's quite good at it. John you know, later made a nice thing of giving dinner speeches in which he pretended to be Winston Churchill. But we became friends, and uh, and and he ended up in the White House as a speechwriter. Uh, and so he learned through that mechanism, through the White House grapevine, that uh, this postmaster general needed a uh, speechwriter. So he recommended me, and they asked me to come down, and uh, I wrote a speech for them, and they liked it, and uh, read, uh, you know, like a lot of Southerners has a, had, a, had an ear for the language, you know, he, he just... Uh, and he trusted me, and uh, and I learned his inflections and his style, and what he would say and what he wouldn't say, and so on. So uh, it, uh, it was a pretty good relationship. And then I got invited to to come to the White House. Uh, Bob Finch, I think, was part of the, the kitchen cabinet, uh, and he asked me to come. And I uh, uh, and it was a great opportunity, and I turned it down. I just felt a great loyalty to Red Blunt, who I really loved. He was just a wonderful mentor, a great man. And I said no. Uh, then uh, sometime later, I don't know, six, six eight months later, uh, 
they changed the speech writing operation at the White House. Jim Keogh went off to, uh, went back to Time Magazine, I guess, and Ray Price took over the operation. And Pat Buchanan and Bill Sapphire went off on their own. So uh, I was asked to come, and this time uh, uh, it was to write for the president. And Red said, uh, you know, when the president asks you to do something, you have to do it. So go. And I did. What was your impression of the Nixon White House at that point? Well, uh, of course, you're always dazzled. You know, I was a, I was a young, young person. A very interesting thing happened, uh, actually. Uh, that White House was very meticulous about the president's speeches. Anything he said, anything that uh, was going to come out of the White House had to be perfect. And so we had a big research operation and so on. And everything had to be vetted. I mean, everybody got to pee on the bush. You know, if you had uh, whatever the remarks were about, there always would be competing interests. You know, Peter Flanagan would have one view, and uh, Virginia Nauer would have another. And you had to reconcile these as a speechwriter. So it turns out that the poets are not the great unacknowledged legislators of the world. It's the speechwriters. Because we did these legislative messages, you know, that, that uh, went to the Hill, and people don't seem to do that anymore, but this president proposed legislation. Uh, now, well, I'm telling you this, uh, because uh, when I went there, it was uh, January 19th of 71. I remember Dave Gergen and I went and joined the White House the same day. Uh, and uh, they were all out in San Clemente working on uh, the State of the Union address. I weren't really paying too much attention to things. Now, I didn't go to San Clemente. I was back at the White House. All the other heavy breathers were out there. You know, they all needed rug time, so they were all there. And uh, John Ehrlichman said he wanted me to write a speech. And I think he, he called me on the phone. I didn't meet with him, but he said that he wanted a speech to give the University of Nebraska. and. He had talked to somebody on a plane somewhere, and the person said something about our children. And there was some convoluted formulation about talking to the young. And that was all the guidance I got for this. So, uh, so what, was, what was happening was uh, Cliff Harden had been the uh, Secretary of Agriculture. And he was from, he had been the provost or the chancellor or whatever of the University of Nebraska, and he had extracted a, a promise from President Dixon that uh, he would come to the university and speak sometime during his tenure. Well, uh, Hardin was resigning from the cabinet, and now he called in the, called in the, the promise. So something that had to be done, it wasn't the focus of the White House's attention at all. But uh, uh, but Nixon fulfilled a promise with the speech that I wrote, and nobody checked it. It didn't get vetted in anything. And it was, and I proposed an alliance of generations. I mean, remind, remember, this is a difficult time here. We had these people shot at, at Kent State, and, and uh, the president. Uh, I, in fact, I wrote the speech in which the president, uh, or the legislative message in which he. Uh, 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 gave up the draft, you know, and that was largely to settle these campuses down. And he later said it was a big mistake that we should have not gotten rid of the draft, uh, and I happen to believe that. But, but at any rate, uh, he gave this, uh, this speech about, uh, you know, reaching out to young people. Well, it just, it just was, you know, it was just a magnificent speech. <laughs> <laughs> and you can go back and check it. The Christian Science Monitor just could, just drooled all over it. This is the man we thought we had elected president. Uh, Time Magazine, the local newspaper, everybody was just, just bazooka about this, this speech, reaching out to the young. And, and I thought, you know, I, I had it made now. I was the next great uh, speechwriter in the White House. Well, that wasn't realistic because all the others, you know, stop that in its tracks, uh, and, uh, and I never got a chance to do that again. Uh, I mean, I did an awful lot of writing, but it, it was always very carefully uh, vetted after that. Uh, because it was like, you know, we, we, we shouldn't be reaching out to young people. We need to hammer them. <laughs> 
So, uh, but anyway, that's that. That's where it, it started. And I had a uh, meeting. And Nixon wanted to meet with me, and so uh, we went over. I suppose we were these five-minute grip and grin things with a photo op, and uh, he. Uh, uh, he, he was not a great conversationalist, as, as is pretty well known now. Was, so we kind of sidled around each other, and finally he said, uh, well, what are you reading? And I was embarrassed because, it, because there was a book called The Guns of August. It was Barbara Tuckman's uh, uh, very popular book uh, about the beginning of the First World War. And, uh, uh, it, of course, it had come out during the Kennedy administration, and, and I'd never read it, so I thought it was a little funny telling him that I'd gotten around to reading a book that's been out for eight or nine years. But, but I did. I said, uh, well, I'm reading uh, The Guns of August, Mr. President. And it just connected. I mean, he just lit up. He said, oh, my God. He said, that's a, he said that opening chapter. He said, the beginning lines in that book are magnificent. You know, and he went on, because if you recall, it's about the, the last great funeral and all the heads of state come together. And I forget which George or somebody died in England and, uh, and they all had this meeting. And this was the last big thing before the world went to hell in the First World War. Uh, but, I, but I realized, I mean, as I thought about it later, uh, President Nixon saw these state funerals particularly as opportunities for statecraft. Because normally, I and mean, if you went back to, to what happened in Vienna with Khrushchev and, uh, and Kennedy and, uh, and uh, uh, Dean Rusk's uh, article in Foreign Affairs in which he talked about how, you know, how dangerous summit conferences were and you had to be careful how you put these things together. And of course, by now, you know, we knew this was the case, and so summit conferences were so carefully programmed. I mean, there'd be an arrival statement, and there'd be a prearranged agreement, and a departure statement, and a joint statement, and all this stuff. And you could have sent one of the office boys to do this. You know, it just didn't, there wasn't that much room for the kind of thing that, that President Nixon excelled at, which was, you know, he, he absolutely was a stone genius about relationships in, in, in the world. And so, uh, but a state funeral was one of these spontaneous things, you know. You really had much time to mess around here. And so people, and it was, a, it'd be a time of some emotion, you know. People were in a different frame of mind when they came to these things. And that was just a golden opportunity for a man like Richard Nixon. So that's why he, he keyed to that, uh, that, uh, that opening in the, and uh, the guns of August, but for the, you know, but and we talked for an hour. You know, I wanted to know about my wife, and she's teaching at Bryn Mawr, and uh, and from then on, whenever he would call me for any reason, which didn't happen a lot, but occasionally it did, and he'd say, uh, "Well, uh, <clears throat> how are things at Swarthmore?" And I'd say, "Well, they're pretty good at Swarthmore College, Mr. President." Uh, Chris June's at Bryn Mawr. Oh yes, yes, very fine uh, Quaker school, yes. <laughs> and he was. Uh, you know, from a distance, this is today, I mean, if you look at the Clinton White House, there were people who just hate Bill Clinton, the Bush White House, and they hate George Bush, and a lot of people hated Richard Nixon. But when you know one of these people personally and work for them, you have a different view. And uh, I found him a very considerate, uh, uh, thoughtful man, and uh, just, just a kindly man. And uh, so I have great uh, admiration for him. So you said you went over to the White House. So your offices as speechwriters were in the old executive office? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Huge, by the way. <laughs> yeah, they were, that was before they started subdividing the old EOB. And it, was, uh, it was great to have a, to have a you know, that sort of semi-basketball court for, a, for an office. And there was a whole team of you who were the speechwriters for the president. Yeah, yeah. There was. Uh, they say Ray Price was the uh, was the, uh, the head of the speechwriting operation. Dave Gergen was sort of his uh, chief editor uh, and organizer. Uh, there was uh, Ann Morgan, uh, Lee Hebner, who was a brilliant editor, went on to. Uh, and he was a publisher of the uh, 
International Herald Tribune. I think he's now he's teaching at Northwestern or something. But he's a, he was a, just astonishingly good editor, really much better than Ray actually. Um, John Anderson was an uh, interesting young fellow, very good, uh, very good writer. I think I have to say, immodestly, he and I are probably the best writers on the staff. And John was disciplined where I wasn't. Uh, so at five o'clock, his desk was clean. Five o'clock, I might just be starting to think about, you know, I'd spend a day going out and having a three martini lunch and all this stuff, and then I'd, I'd, uh, but I got it done. But John. Uh, John was a, uh, a Christian scientist, so uh, without fail, along about uh, October, he would get a bad cold, and uh, and he'd get rid of it sometime around the following April or May. You know, so we all had to go through that with him, uh, and, and we all had colds for <laughs> for, for six months with John. Uh, who else was there? There was. Uh, a guy named John Coyne, who had been on uh, Agnew's staff. Uh, you know, Agnew just walked out the door one day and never came back. I mean, he was a, a, not a very good person. And uh, so he didn't tell any of the people that he was going to Baltimore to cop a plea and resign. And all these guys were left in the lurch. So, so we brought him in, uh, we brought in uh, Aram Bakshin, uh, who Aram, I believe, later uh, did some writing for Dole also. Uh, and Aaron was a, was a multi-talented guy. He was a real historian, sort of born in the wrong century. He's, he was, he's sort of an Edwardian type, and just a really a remarkable guy, good writer. How did um, how were the assignments made for you? Uh, would someone say, okay, you go work on this speech, and you go work on this speech, or how, how did that? Yeah, they did. Uh, uh, I, I don't know how, uh, starting out, uh, we sort of fell into uh, niches. So I wrote, uh, it was only going to be on, on Vietnam, I think of this one, that was all over in the NSC. And Kissinger controlled that in, in, in paranoid fashion. I mean, his staff, for example, weren't even permitted to belong to the White House mess. He didn't want them talking to anybody. He didn't want them infected by the outside world. So. Uh, but what what I did, I, I had uh, things like veterans. I had uh, space, which was quite interesting actually, because you, know, you had to write a. And in those days, these things were always high drama. These space shots, we were these were doing the Apollo shots, and uh, so you'd have a launch statement, and then uh, you'd have uh, some suggested remarks for when the president called the. The guys in space, you know, and uh, and then you'd have a welcome home thing, and then you'd have you'd have one that you'd hope you never had to use, which if you had a disaster, you know, all that. And I did all that, and uh, uh, what else did I do? Well, one of the, the big thing that I did toward the end was in '73 when we had the energy crisis. I was the energy writer. In fact, I wrote the first energy policy with all the input that went on with it, but uh, I did that. Uh, transportation policy, I wrote that. Uh, was, but the big thing was energy, finally, because that just consumed, that just sucked the oxygen out of everything. We had the embargo, and that was, uh, that was, uh, you know, if you can believe, we had uh, probably five people uh, led by Charlie DeBona, who was a uh, who was head of the uh, Center for Naval Analysis. They brought him over and uh, his team. Uh, but from that group of five or six people, including myself, uh, Jack Rafuse, uh, Dick Fairbanks, uh, John Schaefer, some others, uh, that's what, that basically was it. And from that, we got. The Department of Energy, which has never produced a drop of oil. I mean, it's this wonderful process the way these things work, but it was total crap. Um, so at some point then, let me ask this question. Um, were you in contact with Dole during this period, and if so, in what capacity? Oh yeah, I was throughout. Well, I'm still writing free speeches for him. Um, and, uh, See what else we did. Uh, um, 
I don't remember uh, other than that. And, and I, I really wouldn't have much contact with Dole himself. It was always uh, Wood White or Bill Taggart or one of these guys that, uh, that would call down. Uh, but uh, now he, he pretty much uh, secluded himself. Uh, but remember, this is a time of tremendous uh, tension up there uh, over Vietnam, and he was—he—he he, he never saw a fight he, he wasn't prepared to jump into or, or to start. Uh, he was—he uh, took on Bill Fulbright, and, and there were always a number of, of, of uh, uh, contentious issues. But yeah, we would. I, in fact, I did see a lot of them, and I'll tell you why I saw a lot of them because. When he became Republican chairman, um, he, he liked it. He liked the title, but he didn't know that he pretty much sold his soul to get it. And uh, uh, so, I happened to be in Chuck Colson's office one day, and uh, it was uh, uh, Chuck was Chuck had basically set up as uh, you know his own shadow government in the White House. Uh, and he was reaching out to all these constituencies and sort of preparing himself to go out and make millions of dollars, and, and you know, as a, as a, as a lawyer. Um, and one of the constituencies he was cultivating was uh, was labor, but he also went after you know veterans and others. And um, the reason I was was meeting with him was. Uh, Nixon, uh, Nixon needed to to have labor in his camp because of the way he was going about trying to end the war in Vietnam, and labor was at least on on board there. And uh, I can't remember who was the head of the AFL CIO at the time. Uh, and just you know, one of these towering figures. I came in. That no, was before Lane Kirkland. Uh, um, before, who the hell was it? But at any rate, I'll think of it maybe. Um, they have their annual convention in uh, uh, somewhere in Florida. I don't know if it's Miami or, but they have this big gathering down there. And uh, so, uh, and normally the president is invited. Well, he wasn't invited, so he invited himself. And this is this is this is. Typical. This is the sort of thing a, a man with Nixon's brains could do. So he said he was coming, and uh, of course you can't say no to the president. So he wanted a speech, and uh, he really wanted to tear into the leadership and but thank the rank and file for their support and the importance of the, you know, standing fast on Vietnam, so we could have a full generation of peace and so on and so on. And uh, so I wrote this, and Chuck kind of went over it, and we got it. We got this hard-edged speech that he wanted to give. And then I got a call saying, uh, the "President doesn't want that. He, he he just wants a laundry list. Just everything we're doing for labor, everything we have done for labor, and we're going to do for labor. Just a good pro-labor speech, and just." No, no, no ages on it. So I said, well, I don't know what the hell was wrong with the first one, but if that's what they want, that's what we'll do. And so I wrote the, this laundry list, basically. So the president goes down there, and uh, he says, now, I have a speech here prepared, uh, and it's the usual stuff. It's all we're doing for labor, and so on. He said, but, uh, but he said, I know you guys like it straight from the shoulder, and that's how I'm going to give it to you. And then he had, he had memorized the, pre, the other, the first speech, <laughs> and that's the one he gave. <laughs> now that was that was kind of fun. But anyway, the point of the story is I'm in Colson's office, and something he had a he had a guy named Ron Howard. I forget what his name was, Howard something Howard. And he was complaining that Dole wasn't telling the mark here, and pretty clearly that he was going to get him. 
So I said, uh, Chuck, I'm, I'm a pretty good friend of Bob's, and uh, there's probably some breakdown of communication here. And he's a little touchy about the way you approach him, so maybe I could help. Okay, fine. Uh, you do it. So we got, uh, I, I talked to Dole, I said, yeah, these guys are going to really stick it to you unless you, you know, get on the right side here. Maybe I can help with that. So uh, we had a, actually had a little sit down. It seemed to me, Colson and I went up the hill and uh, Colson tugged his forelock in the, one of the handy rooms up there in the Capitol. And, they all just lied to each other, you know, and being ultimate hypocrites about how this was all the result of all these faceless people between us, you know, we want to restore this relationship and all that. So, uh, and so, uh, so I was the guy that was going to be the go-between. And not only that, but I suddenly became part of the shadow government in which I was Colson's congressional liaison in large measure, which really made Bill Timmons quite unhappy. He was a, he was a real congressional liaison, so there was some friction over that. But basically my job was to program Bob Dole and to get him to attack this one and attack that one. And, uh, and, but also if the president uh, you know, made a statement, I had to go and get all of our supporters on the Hill to to issue statements saying, huzzah, you know, have you ever heard anything more brilliant, and so on. Or if anybody attacked the president, then I had to, I ended up as the edge on Colson's hatchet, and had, you know, Colson was a hatchet man. Well, this was not a relationship that was destined to prosper, because, because uh, Dole just, you know, I mean, the things that Chuck wanted him to do were crazy. And, uh, uh, and, it, and they were, the, Colson and his people were very attentive to things like Teddy Kennedy's sex life and things like that, you know, and they had the police going for them, taking pictures of his car outside of his girlfriend's house in Georgetown, oh, crap like that. And, uh, and they wanted Dole to get up there and, and accuse these people of, of, of all sorts of stuff. I mean, and Dole was perfectly prepared to fight these people on substantive issues, but he wasn't prepared to get down in the mud, the blood, and the beer. And so uh, he resisted it, and uh, the relationship just uh, curdled. Um, and he was a very bitter man, obviously, um, because it turned out that this, this job that he had sought had been a poison apple. Um, and there wasn't any way I could fix it, ultimately. I mean, I had started having my own problems with Colson. And uh, finally said, the hell with it, and went back to the speech writing operation. But this all transpired in the run up to 1972. And, uh, and in that run up, I did, I'd traveled with, with Dulles from time to time. I remember <laughs> we went down to. Uh, Palm Beach, he was invited down there by uh, Mrs. Phipps, and she sent her uh, airplane up for us, and, uh, uh, and quite frequently, he'd, he'd want me to go with him to places, so I, and I would, you know, it's kind of, so we flew down there, there was uh, Dole and myself, by this time, uh, he and Phyllis were divorced, and, uh, and we flew down there with Earl Butts and his wife. And I remember we had this this uh, magnificent dinner at the Breakers, and uh, Bob, you know, he he's got a problem with his hand. I mean, he can't things like cutting his meat, and if he's with strangers, he's not comfortable. So how are you going to get this done? So he just avoids it. You know, he'll eat whatever he, he, he can that's put in front of him. But if, if it means cutting meat or something like that, he, so and of course he's a politician. So he's spending all his time circulating. And not only that, some snazzy blonde attached herself to his behind and just circulated with him. And he kind of was dazzled about it, like this. You know? And uh, and so when he finally got went back and sat down next to Mrs. Phipps, she just gave him unshirted hell. I mean, she just, just tore into him and made it clear that she had not invited him to come down there and go into the trouble of sending a plane for him to be ignored at her dinner. And, uh, and I think she was jealous of the blonde, too. But, uh, 
but that's one incident I remember. And, and Dole was really sort of nonplussed. He was like, what the hell is that all about? <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, that's, uh, uh, I, I would travel with him from time to time. And uh, How, <clears throat> how uh, was he held in regard by rank-and-file Republicans? Was it really just the White House he was having problems with as the RNC chair, or were there others? It, no, I think, uh, I think it was probably just the White House. I think, uh, you know, Bob was kind of an inflammatory guy. You know, there were people who didn't like him. He just... Uh, he was not. Uh, he, he was. He, he didn't have a lot of judgment. He, I mean, he, he liked being the tough guy, and uh, he liked the attention that it got. I remember this is. We're still in this period. Now everybody's irreverent and cynical and so on. But in those days, there were whales. There were people like Richard Russell and Edward Dirksen and William Fulbright, people like this. And if you were a freshman senator, you had to learn what the business was about. Mind your P's and Q's and, and get yourself reelected once at least. And then maybe you'd get a nice committee assignment and, and so on. You'd be off and running. But, but, uh, but here came this, this uh, bumptious uh, guy from the Midwest who wasn't listening to any of that stuff. You know, I mean, it was part of his character. When he, uh, when he finally was able to, to get out of bed and resume life, he told his brother Kenny, he said, because uh, he, he'd been down for three years, he said, I'm going to get those three years back. So he was, he was, he was a very restless, very impatient uh, person. And that was uh, the way he behaved. Uh, he, he wanted to get somewhere. It wasn't clear where he wanted to get to. But uh, he wanted to make up for all the time he'd spent on his back. So, uh, uh, At the time he was selected, <coughs> uh, you said Hugh Scott was not in favor of, of, of Dole. Yeah. Right. Did, you, did you have a sense Scott had a favorite candidate for that position or, or not? Uh, I don't know. I think it was probably anybody but Bob. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, uh, I can't remember who had been the chairman or why. Oh, you no, know, I do. Re I don't remember his name, but I recall uh, there was a sense that we hadn't done very well in the in the in the '70 campaign, and we were not happy with the uh, with the chairman, and it was sort of. For a lot of the reasons that they would be not happy with Dole too, uh, uh, he just wasn't taking orders from the from the White House, and you have to. I mean, the president's head of the party. So, uh, so they, whoever that was, I don't remember who it was, but he had played a role in Nixon's successful '68 campaign. But anyway, they got rid of him and uh, put Bob in there, and uh, Bob just didn't work out at all. And I think, I think. Probably, if Hugh Scott or anybody else had a uh, had a candidate, it would have been a technician. It wouldn't have been a senator. You know, you're always worried about. Uh, you had a senator in there, and he had a point of view. He might not be uh, compatible with other senators. So you didn't want anybody in there that, that would, it was. I mean, it's sort of seen as a conflict of interest. You know. The way you describe Colson's operation in the White House, it, it, it's a little bit, uh, I'm curious, how was Nixon tolerating him sort of operating on his own, or was he so in sync with Nixon that there was no, he wasn't it? Well, you know, that's a good question. Uh, and I, and I want to be clear, I, I wasn't privy to a lot of this thinking, you know. I mean, I wasn't Nixon's alter ego. I was just... Uh, uh, but I can hazard a guess. I mean, uh, Ray Price, for example, used to say uh, Chuck's, Chuck's constituency, Chuck's only constituency is, is, uh, is Nixon's worst instincts. And it was a good formulation uh, because Colson just came in there. I mean, Colson was a chameleon. You know, hell, he worked for one of the most rectitudinous uh, senators uh, from, was from Vermont. Who was it? Uh, Anyway, his background. He, Chuck's an interesting guy. You know, he, he was the youngest rifle uh, company commander in the history of the Marine Corps, and probably still holds that record. There was a story about how he he managed. He, he went to Brown because he got a scholarship to Harvard, and uh, when he went up there to talk to the admissions officer, the guy started telling him about what life at Harvard was going to be like, and Chuck said, "I haven't even decided to come yet." 
and, uh, and this could be apocryphal. But his story's been around for a long time. And so, uh, and the guy said, "Well, nobody's ever turned down a scholarship to Harvard." So, that, that I'm number one. <laughs> and he went to Brown. So. Uh, he was a very dynamic guy. I mean, people look at the White House through the wrong end of the uh, telescope uh, and sneer at people like Haldeman and Ehrlichman and Nixon's Dobermans and things like that. But these were these were, were smart men, powerful men. I mean, uh, Haldeman was a was a really compelling personality. John Ehrlichman was, couldn't have been less like. Haldeman. I mean, he was congenial. He was funny as hell, uh, very witty uh, and thoughtful. Uh, and it was a White House where you couldn't. Uh, there wasn't any point in stabbing your buddy in the back to get anywhere because it didn't work that way. You couldn't. You know, wherever you were was where you were going to be, and uh, and you couldn't. Also, you couldn't go out and capitalize on your position in the White House. That was frowned on. I mean, it was it was just another invidious comparison that they wanted to create with the, with the way uh, Johnson and his people did did business. So you didn't capitalize on your, your on the honor that you had to serve your country in the White House. So uh, uh, so Colson came, you know, just swept in there, and uh, I had a. Uh, when it was all over, I went to uh, work uh, for Occidental Petroleum, for, uh, one of Armand Hammer's uh, uh, subsidiaries, Oxy, Occidental International, as a vice president. And uh, the president was a guy named Marvin Watson, who had been Lyndon Johnson's uh, chief of staff. And we, and a, and a wise man, we talk, we talk about the Nixon tragedy, and uh, he said, Nixon's problem, you know, and, and Colson's role. I mean, I hold Colson responsible for everything that went wrong, Watergate, the whole thing. It's all Chuck Colson's fault uh, because Nixon didn't know anything about this. He you know, it was this was gone on the side, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Chuck. Uh, uh, well, what, 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 what Marvin said was this. He said, I'd, I'd talk to President Johnson, and he'd say, uh, you know that, that so-and-so uh, Bennett over there at, uh, at Commerce, uh, Assistant Secretary we made over there, that son of a bitch is, he's not a loyal guy. I want him out of here. Get rid of him. Marvin would write it down, get rid of the son of a bitch over at uh, Commerce. And then he'd say, and then, you know, I'd go back in, like we'd have our daily meeting, and I'd, about two weeks later, I'd bring it up. I said, uh, you remember that guy, uh, Roger Bennett, over at uh, Commerce? He said, I'm working on getting him out of here, but uh, uh, his, his, his kid's just finishing school, and of course his wife has had this uh, operation for, for breast cancer, and uh, he's sort of, you know, and he'd say, well, you know, Johnson would say, oh, for Christ's sake, you know, you know I don't mean that. And, uh, but he said, every president has got to be able to blow off steam. And, they t and it, was, it seems to me that's true. I've never been in there when steam was blown off, but you can hear it on the tapes. And so, uh, but, Nick, but Nixon didn't have that. You know, he, he'd say, we had to shoot that son of a bitch, and Colson would go out and try to get the guy shot. And if you're the president, you learn pretty quickly that, as, as Someone pointed out that the, the only power in that office is the power to persuade. And all of a sudden, you know, you say, do it, and it gets done. Hell, that, that's really, that's new, that's novel. And uh, so that seemed to be, you know, what, what, uh, what went wrong. Uh, Colson would go off and do this stuff, but uh, I don't think it was initiated in any way by, by the president. Do you recall your first contact with Bob Dole after his famous trip to Camp David? Well, uh, I really don't. I mean, I, I, I don't precisely, I mean, I'm getting old too, but, uh, I don't remember. I, I knew, I just don't remember. I know, I, I met with him somewhere on there and he was very, very bitter. And he said, uh, they called me up to the mountain and threw me off. Um, you were still in the White House at that point. Oh, yeah. So he might have unloaded a little bit with you about his, uh, 
I don't remember that he did. I, I just, I, I think, uh, I, I don't remember that he did. It would not have been out of character, but I don't recall that. Uh, I, mean, I mean, first of all, it's, it's uh, getting fired is not, you know, for a proud man, it's, uh, it's a little difficult. You don't want to flash your ass too much over the subject. Uh, but, but throughout, I mean, when, when, uh, when Bob was going through this uh, turmoil of, of trying to resist what Colson wanted him to do, uh, I mean, he would duck him. He would, he, would, he would not return his phone calls. Or he, would, you know, he would leave messages that he was out and things like this. It was, it, was, it, was, it was really pretty silly. And a lot of things we did, I mean, God, I can tell you stories about we tried to bankrupt the, uh, the Democratic National Committee, almost managed to do that, um, so on. But, um, Any particular um, dull stories from along this line? Well, yeah, one of them was, uh, uh, this was the sort of thing that, that Bob was happy to have a chance to, to do because it, it wasn't, it wasn't in the realm of accusing Teddy Kennedy of fornicating with sheep and things like that. So he was happy. I mean, he said, "You know, I got to work with these people." And uh, so, so one of the things we devised was uh, we found out that the uh, you know back then Ma Bell was a still a monopoly. So. Uh, uh, that the Democratic National Committee had not paid their phone bill from the previous campaign, from 68. And uh, so we chose to characterize this as, a, as, a, uh, as an illegal contribution to, uh, to the party. And uh, so, we, so we, what I did was Probably, I don't think it was illegal, but it was pretty unethical. We went out and solicited a shareholder to uh, uh, to bring a suit against the, the, the board to force them to to, uh, to uh, make the DNC, which was broker than the Ten Commandments at that time, to force them to pay their phone bill. So it was either pay the bill and end up broke or don't pay the bill and get your phone cut off. We thought either one of those was a good outcome. And it was fun. I mean, it may not sound like fun, but it was fun. So, uh, uh, and Bob got into this thing. He thought this was great, because it was, you know, it was, it, was, it was something that got him away from Colson, and yet it looked like this was doing something really to, you know, to, as it looked, to help the party. He was always saying, I'm out there trying to build up the party. You know, Colson didn't want him out there building up the party when I'm doing what he was told to do. So uh, we not only got this suit filed, but we started urging people everywhere we went, we would urge them. I think we issued, you know, we had a press, uh, a press uh, conference in which we urged people to uh, pay their phone bill uh, into an escrow account and uh, not pay the phone bill. Because after all, the Democrats didn't have to pay the phone bill, why should you? And if you were, I mean, it's really inflammatory stuff, you know, you could be home with a sick child and, uh, and uh, couldn't afford to pay your phone bill. Do you think that the, the, the Ma Bell would care? They'd, they'd, they'd cut your phone bill off and there you'd be with your sick baby, you know? So we did that sort of thing. And uh, and so we tried to, you know, we also urged the state uh, uh, Republican uh, uh, committees to stop paying their phone bill. Well, this is just really infuriating uh, uh, the people at AT&T, and particularly the, the lobbyist, I don't know what the hell his name was, uh, I think McWhorter, I think Charlie McWhorter, you know, that's who it was. And I got a phone call from him one day, which just sort of cascaded down because he, he, he didn't operate at my level. He called somebody called, said, "Well, that sounds like something Colson might be involved in." So he called Colson. Colson, gee, I don't know anything about that. Yeah, maybe maybe an old cook would call. So by the time he got to me, he was strangling. I mean, he was just absolutely beside himself. He was he was hardly coherent on the phone. And. Uh, I said, yeah, I, don't, I don't know, I don't think I can help you. I don't know what, you know, and I dusted him off. But he was pissed because he was getting a lot of heat from uh, upstairs. You know, why do you think we hired you so that you could, 
you know, let something like this happen to us because they, they didn't like it. And uh, so uh, anyway, we started telling people, you know, don't pay your phone bill. AT&T's giving uh, the Democrats a free ride. Maybe they'll give you one too. So of course these committees started uh, paying their phone bills into escrow, and of course <laughs> AT&T cut them off. <laughs> so that didn't work. But it went on for probably six, eight weeks, or just that sort of thing it was kind of fun. How did it resolve in the end? They paid their phone bill. <laughs> well, the Democrats didn't. They forgave that. It just got written off. But uh, but apparently, I mean, one thing I did get from the recorder conversation was that. That Republicans owed money to. They, you know, it's just one of those things that just got written off. But yeah, it was. Uh, there, there were things that were funny that happened all the time. But Dole, would, Dole had this uh, this uh, conception that what he called the the the, the elect and the select. And uh, if you were elected, you had the mandate of the people. And if you were an appointee, you'd just been selected. You know, you didn't have any mandate at all except that the guy knew you and hired you. So he didn't think that he should have to be told by an appointee what to do. And he was there to represent the people of Kansas first. But uh, but he, he, was, he was bitter, ain't no question about that. So at what point did you leave the, <clears throat> the White House? Uh, well, the president resigned on the 9th of August, and uh, I stayed with the, the Ford people, uh, who I had, as a result of working for Colson, I'd managed to alienate some of them, uh, particularly on Ford staff, while he was still uh, uh, on the Hill. And uh, so I was not destined to, to stick around very long in the Ford administration, so I left uh, in November. Uh, they, I could have gone to, over to uh, Energy or Treasury or something like that, uh, but I was ready to leave. And that's when you went to Occidental? That's when I went to Occidental. But then <clears throat> you participated in the 76 vice presidential campaign with Dole? Or? Yeah. Right. Tell me about that. Well, I, was, I went to Occidental, I stayed there for a year, and I left. I just didn't care for it. I, the, uh, the people that ran the office in Washington, there was one person who was a pathological liar, and I just was not comfortable with somebody that was, was, uh, as, uh, as dishonest as he was. I mean, he was, he was just somebody you couldn't, you, you didn't know where you were at any time with this guy. Uh, and so, uh, so I so I left. And uh, in fact, and Armand called me and asked me not to leave, and I I, I did. I just I just had had it with uh, this guy named Bill McSweeney. I mean, he's still he's on the board at the Kennedy Center. He'd done well, you're very well for himself, but he's the most dishonest person I've ever dealt with in Washington. Uh, and so I and I I had uh, stock options, and I had a nice. Uh, buy out, so I, I just went across the street and opened up a little office. I had no idea what the hell I was doing uh, to, to, God knows what, represent companies, something. And I had a few clients, but it was, you know, I just lived on what I'd gotten from Occidental. And so, uh, and I did some speech writing. I did uh, work for uh, Lowell Weicker and, and, of course, Dole. And after, uh, after, well, this is, uh, so I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, uh, I, when I left, uh, when I left the White House, or when I left the Occidental, that was '75, and I was still close to Dole, and uh, so I just continued. I mean, I had no financial worries, uh, and uh, uh, so I. Uh, was working with him, still writing speeches, and then came along the, uh, the convention in Kansas City, and he wanted me to write a speech. He was going to be you know, a keynote speaker. Well, he, he had a big speech there. And uh, so I wrote it, and we went down there with him. Uh, well, he was to give it, and of course, we were at that point where we felt like we could get him the nomination for vice president. And I had uh, 
some connections there. Dave Gergen was working for uh, Ford, and uh, he had survived the putsch after the, you know, after Nixon left. And uh, so I, um, so I went, and of course, uh, that's when I met Dave Owen. And uh, Dave was working the candidate, or working the delegates to, to get uh, Dole nominated. And Dole was, uh, I mean, you could see that part of Dole that was very unattractive because he believes in, he's, he, he's, he believes in magical, he's a magical thinker. You know, there's a term in psychology, magical thinking. And if you just, you know, believe uh, and let things alone. So he was upset with Dave because Dave was out there talking to the delegates, saying, well, if you're going, you know, if you go, if, if Howard Baker doesn't get it on the first ballot, would you support uh, Bob Dole? And he's just doing the things you do. And Dole, of course, was like divorcing himself from, from that process, from Dave Owen, from reality itself for a while. And, uh, but uh, I remember Dave came in one day, he's just bone tired, and sort of slumped down in the chair. And, that's the first time I met him. He walked in the room and I introduced himself and he walked over and he slumped down and the, the easy chair was in my room. And uh, he said, you know, it's really a pleasure to bust your ass for Bob Dole. <laughs> and I, I, I said, so anyway, he got the nomination and he gave a speech and gave it pretty well, actually. Uh, we had adjoining rooms, so there was a there was a door, and it was his room, and my room. I brought my wife down by that time, and I remember he got the phone call and I just knock on my door, and I opened the door, and, and uh, it was Bob uh, and Elizabeth was peering over behind him, and he put his hand up. I guess this one, you know, it's like it's us. So he and I thought, you know, it's one of those ones. Dole can be very touching, you know, and uh, he was very happy and just, just totally happy, and I was happy for him. We're gonna stop here to change tape. Okay, I think we were talking about the uh, the Kansas City Convention. Right. Uh, anything else about that? You recall? No, he got the nomination, and uh, and uh, as I recall, went directly to uh, Russell, and uh, I, I, would, I did not uh, accompany him on that trip. Um, we went back to Washington, and then uh, and the question was, now he got the nomination, what's he going to do? And. Uh, I think the Ford people assumed that he had an organization that could function, which he didn't. Uh, now that he had the nomination, he felt like he, you know, he was at the top of the hill and he could do a lot of things himself. And it just went to hell pretty quickly because uh, he, first of all, he didn't have a good advance operation. And he brought in two guys who were, I mean, one of them was more incompetent than the other. And at any given day, you couldn't figure out who was on the bottom. Uh, and, uh, uh, but he, he was, it went, you know, once this thing had been achieved for him by Dave Owen, now he wanted to keep Dave Owen at arm's length. He was, I mean, Bob would oscillate back and forth you know, this, problem of being very dependent on people and then resisting that dependence and uh, so that that proved to be a problem early on and it was a problem that never got itself solved and so the campaign never got off the ground basically uh, he was uh, he oh one of the things that he did which was which was Typical Dole was, you know, he, he he says things without thinking about the import of what he's saying. So I don't know where this occurred, but it occurred early on, and that was uh, they were talking about presidential debates, and Dole either initiated or somebody else said maybe you ought to have vice presidential debates, and Dole jumped on it and said, yeah, that's a great idea. He'd like to do that, or words to that effect. And that just sucked the oxygen out of the campaign because he spent the rest of the time, the rest of the, the campaign, trying to avoid the fact that he was going to have to debate Fritz Mondale, which he manifestly did not want to do. 
and uh, so he sort of dumped it on Dave to, to, to stop it, to get, get him out of the, the debate. Well, I couldn't, you know, I mean, uh, Mondale had said, yeah, this is fine, so he signed up to it. And so they, they just came with as many different ways as they could devise to stop this thing. It was a scheduling issue, it was this and it was that, and, uh, uh, and Dave couldn't, couldn't get, you know, the best he could do was to get the format to where it might help Dole a little bit. But uh, so then Dole, of course, blamed Dave for not getting him out of the, the debate. So it just was one damn thing after another. And meanwhile, the campaign went forward. He wouldn't prepare for the debate at all. And one very famous uh, incident, we had uh, uh, set up a, uh, they brought in some, some high-speed uh, producer from, uh, from California, and I think Tully Plesser, who was a very competent guy, uh, and uh, uh, Dave and uh, Forget who else was there, but anyway, I guess it was, and I was there. And what they did was they set up a, a, a complete studio in Nelson Rockefeller's dining room over on Fox Hall Road. And uh, the idea was to get Bob to practice, you know, to get the feel what it was like behind the podium, or behind the, the lectern, and, uh, and so on. And so. Uh, uh, and it was, we had and all this equipment, I mean, this is, you know, this is, this is beginner stuff compared to what they were dealing with, you know. And, because uh, it was, it was the real stuff. And it cost thousands and thousands of dollars to run it. And Dole wouldn't come. He refused to come. I always had a scheduling issue, and it was always just not the other thing. He always found a way to get out of this. So it was the last day, and people were really tearing their hair out by now, so it was the last day he finally agreed to, to come over to Rocky's uh, house and go through this thing. But he acted as though he was doing everybody a favor by doing it. And of course, he wouldn't debate. He wouldn't go through, he wouldn't make any effort to go through the motion. He just came and looked around like, you know, like he was, you know, Campaigning, he was like, you know, getting any rain, you know, how you doing? So, and I said, what the hell? So, and they kept trying to tease him, uh, you know, just try it out, Bob. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's gonna be good. You know, see what here, and I'll get behind the podium. Then we had two of them set up, you know, like I'll be Fritz Mondia. Uh, he wouldn't have any parts of it. And meanwhile, one of the people that's working closely with him and trying to help him was Ted Stevens, and Ted had his own damn campaign up in Alaska. And so he had his people preparing all these position papers and the points and everything that Dole was going to have to learn. Dole ignored all of it, just refused to, to do anything uh, with it. And, uh, and I remember at one point uh, the butler peeking in, the, in the, the dining room and taking a very disapproving uh, view of all of these shenanigans, and particularly Ted Stevens, who was sitting on a, on a uh, buffet. Uh, banging his feet on the buffet <laughs> because he was he was nervous he was pissed off and he was just you know and Bob was blowing his whole thing and finally Bob left so uh, and it just was you know, it was what it was um, so that went on and uh, he would he, he, they would they would schedule him these guys that he had brought in initially to to to, to work for him they were like his guys he didn't want any of Jerry Ford's people he didn't want anybody telling him what to do he's going to run his campaign and he never run a decent campaign ever I mean it was always somebody else had to bail him out so. So, uh, and they'd schedule him for uh, breakfast in Spokane and, uh, and, a, and a lunch in Miami and dinner in Boston. Yeah. Well, he's not a strong man. I mean, he's, it's amazing he's lived as long as he has, but, uh, but I don't mean to, you know, he tires. Uh, if you have bag drag at, uh, at 5 o'clock in the morning, he's got to get up at 4 o'clock because it takes him longer to get dressed than anybody else. And uh, so, so they just wore him out right, right, right from the beginning. He was exhausted, and he does. He, he's not at his best when he's exhausted. He would, uh, uh, and I had to come on the plane writing the speeches for him. And uh, but he would never approve a speech or approve a, a, a anything in time to, for us to write a press release in time for the press to file it. He was at war with the press 
the whole time. And of course, he blamed them for all his problems. Um, and he wouldn't concentrate, and uh, we couldn't, you know. So finally, everybody hated everybody. Uh, and he would go, and he'd get, he'd get up uh, to speak, and he'd tell the bear joke. Are you familiar with the bear joke? You don't know you're about the bear joke. Okay. You tell the bear joke. Okay, I'll tell you about it. Bear walks into a bar and says, uh, let me have a beer. The bartender gives him, gives him a beer. Bear drinks a beer. He says, how much is that? The bartender says, well, wait a minute. So he goes in the back, talks to the man, he sees the bear out there. And uh, he just had a beer and he wants to know how much to charge him. The guy says, well, hell, you won't know any difference. We charge him $4.50. He goes back out and he says it'll be four fifty. So bear puts five bucks in the bar. He says, I'll have another beer. There's another bear, put the beer and puts down another five dollars and takes a change and starts to walk out. The bartender said, uh, excuse me, before you leave, he said, I he said, I'm just wondering if you don't mind my asking. Uh, uh, he said, We don't get many bears in here. Bear said, four fifty a beer is no wonder you're gonna get many more. That was the bear joke. Bob told that joke every place we stopped. If he, if he stopped three times a day, he told the bear joke three times a day. And the press, after a while, just started to retch. I mean, they'd hear this in the back of the room, and, and, and Bob would say, Bear walks into the bar, and you hear his, Because <laughs> at that point, there was no collegiality, and there was nothing. And so, uh, and so, and then of course the ultimate silly. Well, they, first of all, they got a bear. They got a teddy bear, and they gave get press credentials and sunglasses for the bear. And the bear had his own seat on the plane. And the bear's name was Bear Lee Abel, which signified the fact that they were barely able to cover the campaign because of the way the candidate was behaving. And so, uh, but then one night, for some reason, Dole stood up at this place and the press was all there in the back of the room the way they are and he started into a speech and he didn't give the bear joke and it was like the whole universe had turned upside down and all of a sudden you hear bear joke bear joke <laughs> so he, could, he, he had to stop the speech and tell the bear joke and it went on from there that was you know that was what it was anyway but he, he couldn't because he didn't pay attention to the speeches. And instead of just getting a stock speech and giving, he wanted a new speech every place he went, or he wanted a response to something Jimmy Carter had said. And uh, so he, he, would, uh, he, he, would, he would, first he'd tell the bear joke, and then he would start through these, so a, 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 an increasingly protracted string of self-deprecatory remarks. A little of that stuff goes a long way. And Bob would start out, you know, well, it's uh, nice to be here with you tonight. Of course, when you're a Republican, it's nice to be anywhere. You know, it's, it's, and then he'd start telling, you know, these just, just, just uh, quips. And they were quite regularly directed at himself. And you'd be sitting there listening to people over uh, conversations, and they'd be saying things like, he didn't like himself very much, does he? And you know, so it was, uh, and it permeated the campaign. It's important. And people would get on the plane, get off the plane. Pretty soon, people got on the plane, and nobody got off. And the press was getting squeezed in the back. And of course, they're paying for their, you know. And uh, so, no one wanted to move and get them, get another plane, and they weren't having that. They would tell, we can't. It's all we can do to cover the thing now. If we get on another plane, it'll be done. So. So, uh, uh, but he, 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 he would do this and he would go on, he was going to speak for an hour, 35, 40 minutes of it would be this self-deprecatory stuff. And then he would oh my God, i got to give a speech. And he'd start reading it and he'd lose his place and paper would be flying everywhere and you'd just think, Jesus Christ, just, just get through it and get out of here. And that was the way it went through much of the campaign. And it, did, was Ford 
sort of desperately concerned about the oh yeah oh yeah oh yeah was in yeah. there was no way to remedy things well one remedy was they wouldn't let us come home I mean we were out west of the Mississippi and I figured you know I mean, if we lose the West we're gonna lose anyway there's no way he can lose the West well, of course he could uh, but but we got stuck out there they wouldn't let us book anything back on the East Coast which is where they were trying to you know contend for the for the presidency and so uh, uh, they finally uh, uh, Rockefeller's people I think a guy named Joe Canzari I think he's dead now but uh, he got on the plane and he kind of pushed these Cairo uh, advance men and people the schedulers that Dole had brought in and pushed them aside put them in non-horrific jobs and uh, brought in some professionals from Rocky staff but there was a limit. I mean, going back to this magical thinking thing, uh, uh, they had, uh, we had, I remember we, we had an event in Albuquerque, and the next one was going to be in Butte. So we're going to fly from one, from the bottom of the United States all the way to the top, which we could have made, except that Dole heard somewhere that Reagan was going to be at Stapleton Airport. And so he had to divert the plane to uh, Stapleton land so he could have a meeting with Ronald Reagan. It was like something, something wonderful will come of this. Something will change as a result of having met with Ronald Reagan. And we had mischief, you know. We had there was a guy named Lynn Knopfsaker, uh, who was uh, who was Reagan's guy, and he was a you know he was Lynn just died recently. He was a mischief maker, and he would try to undercut Dave Owen, and Dave, you know, would be on and off the plane trying to keep things together, and it just was terrible. And then of course came the debate, and that was the worst of all because he had no preparation at all. So uh, I happened to be with him that day. We were, we, he uh, normally I'd try to avoid him. I'd go on to get get on the bus, but he said, "Come on with me." And so I got in a, in a limo and uh, uh, and we're driving into uh, Houston, and I was. Seems to me I was sitting in the middle, maybe I don't know. But anyway, Bob was on the right hand side of the car in the limo, and uh, there would be like, there wasn't anybody in the streets, and there's no res reception here, just people walking. And as we're going, you know, driving into Houston, uh, Bob was waving to all these people, you know, and I, I said, uh, you know, you gotta save your strength, they're not, you know, uh, uh, you're gonna have to do uh, a lot more of this stuff once you're vice president. And uh, he said, uh, he said, we're not, we're not gonna get elected. And Elizabeth went, Bob, yeah, she was horrified. And he said, no, we're not going to get elected. And this was on the way to the debate? Yeah, this was on the way to the debate, the Alley Theater. Now, at some point during our perambulations around the country on the Bob Dole Express, we were uh, commiserating over the fact that uh, we were being attacked, Ford was being attacked uh, over the economy and unemployment and so on. And now the, the thing was, you know, I said, you need to try to find a way to get across the fact that, you know, because they were always saying when the Democrats were in, we always have full employment. And I said, yes, and when the Democrats have been in, we've been at war. So that eats up your unemployment problem. And when, you're, when you stop a war, you're going to have kind of problems and you're bringing people home, finding jobs for them, and that's really the explanation for the situation. We've got to find a way to convey that. And I uh, said, so, so he gets in the debate, and uh, uh, it started out reasonably well, I guess, but it just started to go to hell because he just he was totally unprepared. Uh, Ted Stevens was there in Houston, had tried to meet with him and tried to help him. He refused to do it. Instead, he and Elizabeth went out and bought a tie. He thought, you know, if she bought him a tie, it would bring him luck. But that's what they did. They bought a Countess Mara tie. Uh, so, and he, he's used to like Senate exchanges where you could get away with this stuff, but you couldn't get away with it in a formal debate thing, and he'd been just refused to deal with it. Now he was in the reality, and uh, it uh, it just uh, he, he was he was getting more and more desperate as the, as the thing went on, and finally. At, he, he, he clutched at a question which really didn't have too much to do with his response, but his response was, 
Well, uh, I counted it up the other day because of something that happened to me, and it was always referring sort of in a blake way to his wound because of something that happened to me uh, at a certain time uh, that, uh, that, if, that if you, if you, the, the number of people killed in Democrat wars would fill the city of Chicago, you know, and it just went, oh my God. And you know, this great big beach ball came floating across the stage in Fritz Mondale's direction. He's there with a Louisville slugger, and he says, does the senator really mean that this country should not have opposed Nazism? You know, he went on that thing. I mean, well, that was it. That was just the definite end of it. And uh, so Dole went back, and it had rained that night. It was just a terrible night all the way around. And uh, Dole went back uh, to his room, and uh, of course, uh, I th oh, I think uh, actually, I think he had a rally afterwards. And John Connolly was uh, getting the crowd whipped up and telling him, you know, Dole really showed him the night, <laughs> which was just nonsense. And, uh, and of course, Jerry Ford called and told him what a great job he had done, but uh, you couldn't stretch this too far, you know. So then he went back to his room and that was it. And the next morning, I never forget, I mean, you wonder how much any of this stuff matters. The next morning, I didn't want to ride in a car with him again. So we all come pouring out of the, the, uh, the hotel and uh, getting on the bus. And uh, the day was just sparkling. It was one of the wonderful fall days. That, there's nothing like being in a campaign at a certain time of the year in America. It was just gorgeous. It was crisp and cloudless. You know, just everything that hadn't been the night before. And so we pile on the bus, and, the, and there's this old black bus driver, and he says, you know, that guy Munson didn't have any right even being on the same stage with Doyle. <laughs> and he said, what the hell? <laughs> so that was it, and it uh, went on and on and on. Uh, and uh, I, I mean, at one point, uh, and Dave Owen, if you've talked, I guess you talked to him, but he'd tell you, they, 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 Jim Baker uh, had called him back to Washington and asked him if he thought that Doe was mentally stable. And I think Dave told him, yeah, he's just tired. But, but as it went on, as we talked among ourselves on the plane, uh, I mean, everybody was totally demoralized. And we just had a very strong feeling that he was scared to death that they might win. And you know, he just was not, he wanted the nomination. And of course he went on and ran for president later, but we thought, yeah, he, he, what, what, what was conveyed was that he, he was totally unqualified for that office and he knew it. Did you participate in any of his subsequent uh, campaigns? No. No, he asked me to and I just, I'd had it with him. I'd had it with him. We, in in, in uh, 77, he was invited by the uh, by the uh, Zionist Organization of America to come to Israel for the 100th anniversary and to speak to them. So he called me and said, should I do it? And I said, yeah, do it. He said, well, I'm not going to go without you. And I said, well, I'm not going to go without June. He said, all right, well, we'll, we'll all go. We'll take Elizabeth. So we did. And uh, I know Israel pretty good, and I took him all over the place, and he met with Begin and met with the top ministers and so on. And uh, there's this tragic, must have been 2,500, 3,000 people in this auditorium in Jerusalem. And Dole came early, he was rested, he read the speech, he got it down pat. And uh, so he got up to speak, and uh, Begin had given Elizabeth flowers and all this stuff. And he's, he's, Begin's a very gracious man. So Dole gets up there in front of all these people, half of whom don't, I don't think, speak English. And some, some subset of them didn't even speak Hebrew. They spoke Yiddish, which everybody gets sentimental about. But it's a horrible sounding language. It's awful when they start shrieking, you know, you, so it makes you think of Hitler's speeches. Uh, 
And he gets up and he starts to, you know, he acknowledges Begin and thanks everybody. And he goes into the speech and he, and he stops and he halts and he says, during the campaign, uh, I used to tell a joke about a bear. And he said, uh, he said it didn't make much sense, but I'm going to tell it to you. <laughs> he told the bear joke and brought the house down. I don't know what they thought he was doing, but but I mean, people were people were collapsing in their chairs. It was just great, and he gave this wonderful speech. But I th one thing that happened. Let me just go back a little bit. After uh, after we lost the campaign, Bob had a uh, a. a a reception at the at the uh, Republican Club up on the hill, and invited everybody that had been in the campaign, including the press. And he got up on two chairs and uh, thanked everybody and spoke, spoke from his heart. And it was a very emotional time. And the reason it was emotional was because. People had seen a side of him that he had that had been totally obscured throughout the campaign, throughout much of his political career. He had no pressure; it was over, and he could be himself. And people were just saying, "God damn him!" You know. They were saying that that Bob Dole could have been elected. It was really quite a time. And then we got together uh, probably the next day at, uh, at the apartment, the Watergate, him and Elizabeth. And uh, he said, uh, people, people think that I'm a bad person as a result of all this, and I'm not, and I'm going to change their mind. And Elizabeth said something, I mean, they figured out, like you always do, you know, in hindsight, how, how many votes have we moved here or there we could have won. And it was something like 200 votes in Ohio or something like that, I don't know what it was. And Elizabeth was trying to, and she was just drained emotionally, and she was trying to be the gracious hostess. And uh, he'd had some of the people there when we arrived, and they weren't important people, they, they left. <laughs> there was Dave and myself, and maybe one other person. And he said, uh, Elizabeth said, uh, Bob, can I can I get something for you? And she was standing behind her. She couldn't, he, he couldn't see her, but I could. And uh, can I get something for you? And he just snapped at her and he said, yeah, 200 votes. And her face just went, just crumbled. I mean, and she just ran into the kitchen. Uh, but when, but then we chatted, and uh, he uh, he said, "Tell me what I need to do to run." And he was he was already thinking about running for president. So that was uh, that was the campaign, and uh, and after that uh, we stayed we stayed close. Uh, I'd see him from time to time. We had made the trip to Israel, which was which was quite nice. Some bad things came of it, but it was generally. All right, and uh, um, that, that's most of uh, what there is worth telling. The rest of it uh, was fairly, uh, you know, I'd see him from time to time. I saw him, uh, the last thing, the thing that sort of ended the, the relationship, or at least put a crimp in it, was uh, I went up to see him, I don't know why, but I went up to see him up at uh, Alsterburg, where he confirmed me. Uh, and, uh, he looked pretty tired, um, and I said, uh, you know, how you doing, you know, usual. we hadn't seen each other for a while, so the usual exchange of pleasantries. And uh, he said, uh, uh, yeah, they said they want me to return to the White House. He said, they want me to, uh, to head up veterans. And uh, I said, well, are you going to do it? And he said, no, he said, they just want me to attack Curry is really what they want me to do. That's the reason they want me in it. And uh, he said, I'm not going to do that. He said, hell, Elizabeth's got to work with a guy, you know. And uh, so that was it. So then, of course, Bob did exactly what they wanted him to do, and he joined up and he attacked Curry and did all the rest of it. So I wrote an op-ed piece about it, which you can probably find. And, uh, and he sent me a 
fairly acerbic letter saying, uh, basically, how, how could you have, I, I never thought you could have stooped so low. He went off with this sort of polemic. I, mean, I just sent him back a note saying, I mean, if you read the, if you read the, uh, the op-ed piece, of course, it's highly laudatory, but uh, he didn't see it that way. So that was it. Um, one, there are so many other areas I'd love to be talking to you about, but it really isn't related to Bob Dole, so we'll have to leave that for right. another time. But um, you were deeply involved in the Round Contra matters. Oh, yeah. And do you have any uh, thoughts about Dole's involvement with that, or is there anything to put together between that issue and, and his career? No. Bob had no role in any of that that I, that I knew of, and I think I knew just about everything there was to know about it. Uh, no, he wouldn't have been involved in that. I'll tell you what, what, one thing he was involved in was was uh, was interesting. I, I don't have all the pieces perfectly in my mind, but I'll just tell you what how I recall it. Uh, when I was in the Pentagon, there was, uh, uh, well, Cap's second military assistant. There was a guy named, there was an Air Force general named Smith. Uh, uh, he was replaced by by uh, Colin, and working with Colin as his assistant was a guy named Rich Higgins. who was a Marine 06. Uh, when Rich rotated out of that position, he wanted to get out in the field. And so he, w he went to southern Lebanon with the Blue Helmets, with the UN contingent, or the peacekeeping force. Now, he'd been in a very sensitive position, you know. I mean, that was just not smart to send Rich over there. But anyway, there he was. Well, he got, uh, he got, uh, he got kidnapped. Uh, and uh, Dole somehow did get involved in that, which I didn't know about until some, we had some casual conversation. But he was, Rich's wife was, a, uh, was, a, was also a Marine, Robin, Lieutenant Colonel, and she uh, was reaching out to everybody. And somehow her and Dole had gotten connected. And Dole had talked to the Israelis. And, and what I'm vague about is the timing, but it was like, uh, it was, it was, there was a disconnect in the time. And the Israelis, uh, you know, they had people in place and they knew where Rich was and they knew he was alive and they told all that. And he passed it back to Robin. Then the Israelis, one of their stupid things that they pulled from time to time, went up into southern Lebanon on a raid and kidnapped uh, one of the uh, Hezbollah guys, Sheikh o o Obeid. Uh, the next thing we knew, Rich, we got pictures of Rich body being hanged. And the Israelis said, oh, they do that all the time. Uh, he obviously had been dead for a long time. It's an old picture. But it didn't square with what they had told Bob originally about that, so we think they lied about it. But how he got involved in it, I don't know. I mean, one of the things that I, that I did with, with, with Bob was to, I mean, at the time, I had a pretty intense interest in Israel and its well-being. And so, and he didn't know squat about Israel or Jews generally, even though he and, he and uh, Arlen Specter both came from Russell, do you know that? So how, how they got a Jew out of Russell, I have no idea. Or got one in there, I don't know. But anyway, uh, uh, but Bob was, was receptive to that. So I kind of tutored him on matters affecting Israel. Uh, one of the things that uh, he did do uh, for me was uh, uh, submitted a uh, Senate resolution. They, they were, there were some people who had been hijacking aircraft in Russia to try to get out of there. One of them that was involved in this was a woman named Silva Zalmanson. And uh, of course, they were, were captured and arrested and uh, sentenced to death. And he uh, 
he put up a uh, Senate resolution asking the Soviets not to execute him. What effect that had, who knows? I don't probably had none whatsoever, but in any event, they didn't execute her. And ultimately, she was deported. And ultimately, when I took him over there in 77, uh, we arranged a visit between his. She had subsequently gone to Israel, so they, they met in Israel on that trip. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, he, uh, he, uh, I forget what the point was where I was going with this thing, but anyway, yeah. Right. Um, let me go in with just a couple of questions. Um, we have interviewed Dave Owen, yeah. and of course there's a lot of good and bad information out there. Um, would you just speak about the man for, for a moment? Well, uh, Dave, uh, of course, you know, we were all younger then, so, and Dave, Dave's a, an attractive guy, you know, he was an athlete, he's a rodeoer in addition to his other achievements, so, uh, he so we just, we just connected, I just liked him immediately, and I think he felt the same way about me, so we, we, uh, we kind of covered each other's back through the, the campaign, and, uh, uh, being a rodeo, you know, we'd, we'd look for opportunities. We'd hijack a couple of tractors uh, while Dole was in town speaking. Uh, we'd, we'd get a couple of these tractors out at the airport and practice roping, you know, and one of them be a horse and the other be a cow. So. But, uh, but he, had, he admired Bob, you know, enormously. And, uh, and, and, it, and had, had been his great benefactor. I mean, Bob Dole is no political genius. I don't care what anybody thinks, but he, he's affecting, and uh, uh, people wanted him to help him. He was just somebody he gravitated to, and uh, and, and Dave did. So, uh, but again, you have to figure out how this mechanism works in which Dole is, is very dependent on people. And we, we'd see, you know, you get wrapped up in a, in a campaign, you're you're in that aluminum tube. For week after week, the, the dynamics become fairly clear. You know, you, there's not stuff going on that you don't quite get. You can see it all. And uh, I mean, one of the things you would see is, is, is uh, I can't remember this guy's name, but he was a jerk. Um, it's better if you don't. <laughs> uh, well, I don't mind talking about any of this, but uh, but anyway, say say it would be me. You know, I'd be up there and I'd be with you know up up in the with, with, with Dole. He wanted me up there. He wanted to talk to me. He wanted to just socialize with me and uh, test ideas. You know, you're always looking for the great idea that's going to do magic. You know, and then you'd start to feel a kind of chilling. And you realize, yeah, you know, okay, he, he, he's, this relationship is just, you know, it's over now. For, for now, he'd go back and uh, send somebody else up there, and he'd, he'd bond with them, and that would go on for a couple of days, and eventually that guy would have to, you know. And so these 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 cycles of dependency and resistance to dependency were just so palpably clear, um, and. Uh, that's, that's the way it was throughout. Well, it was the same thing, you know, in a major way with Dave. I mean, when he married Elizabeth, he didn't, like, he didn't even know what he was worth. Elizabeth, he thought, had some money. And he had, like, I don't know what the hell he had. He had like $24,000 in a, in a checking account and some old war bonds. And so he wanted Dave to figure all, you know, figure out his finances. And Christ, at the time, the guy was chairman of the finance, Senate Finance Committee. So, um, you know, so Dave did did a lot of things for him, and in the end, uh, Dull screwed him, and he ended up going to jail on on for, for on a basis that still is very highly suspect. Uh, certainly, Bob could have stopped that, but I think Bob initiated it, uh, and for whatever reason. So I. Uh, so I, I've seen, you know, there is a mean side to Bob Dole and a stingy one. You know, now that he's he's making money now, but back in those days, uh, I mean, one person when when we came back from, from from that trip to Israel, he had made a side trip at, at my suggestion to uh, Vienna to meet with uh, Wiesenthal, 
Now he built the Zionist organization for all of this. And they said, we didn't sign up to that. You know, we just, we paid, we didn't mind paying everybody else's expenses and so on, but we didn't, some of these. And Bob, uh, Bob's response to them, and they called me, was, uh, no arranged all this, uh, ask him. But it was said in a way that, like there was some kind of financial chicanery on my part. And I just sent him a letter, just, just a, a real blue blazer, saying, I've seen you be rotten to people over the course, and, and I never thought you'd do this to me. I don't want any further to do with you. And, uh, and, and because I was pissed off at him, I started writing a book about him. Well, about three or four months later, I get a phone call. He wanted me to come up and chat. It was all like, like this had never happened. And by now, I'm writing a book, and I'm, I'm not writing a book out of vindictiveness, but I'm having access to all these people because of my relationship with Bob Dole. I mean, people who, who write biographies have to be different, you know. I mean, I guess they are generally mean people or don't have a conscience or something. I couldn't do it. But by the time I was done, uh, Barbara Eisenhower had been my agent, and we, uh, you know, we had a publisher and everything, and I declined to publish it at the end. So a lot of people have been trying to get their hands on that book, but I couldn't, you know, because we were friends again. You know, I just didn't have the, the uh, stomach to to uh, do something that there were things in there that I knew he would have found hurtful, just like with that op-ed piece. He's a sensitive guy, so so I wasted like three years of my life writing something, and then. It's still sitting somewhere around here. So, <laughs> but money was a big thing with him. He, at some point, when I was in the White House, I asked him, as, when he was a Republican chairman, Nixon kept saying that, uh, that Vietnam was not going to be an issue in the campaign, in the presidential campaign. Well, that's a pretty difficult position to sustain. This would have been in 72. 72. So the uh, New York Times asked uh, Dole to write an op-ed piece explaining why the, uh, the Vietnam War wouldn't be an issue in the campaign of 72. So naturally, I get the call. And I wrote this sophistical thing, and it got published. You know. And uh, so I, when, when I give you some background. When I came back from Vietnam, uh, I went to college and I, I raised money and I built an orphanage in Vietnam. Uh, <coughs> but I, I did not, I was not able to support it afterwards. It was turned over to the Catholic Relief Service, they supported But I would like to have been able to contribute money on a regular basis, and I never could. Well, uh, at least in those days, newspapers paid for op-ed pieces. I, I don't know what they paid, but let's say it was 300 hours or something like that. So, so I, uh, this thing got published and I knew he had to have gotten a check for it. And I called Ward White and I said, Ward, tell the senator that uh, I'll give my half of that to, to my orphanage if he'll contribute his half. I didn't hear anything. So about three weeks later, I called. I said, what, what happened with it? How come I never got to hear anything about the check? He said, oh, I asked the senator, he said, uh, he said, if I was rich, I'd give my money away, too. You know, I mean, somebody told me when I was interviewing him for that, for that book, that Bob Dole is so stingy mean, he'd sell a rat's asshole to a blind man for a wedding ring. And I have that for an endorsement. This is from one of his friends. <laughs> That's our boy Bob. But at the same time, there are things to admire. But, but the thing with Dave Owen was, you know. And then he called Dave recently. Wanted to, uh, you know, bygones be bygones. And Dave went up to see him. Now, you know. It's a little bit like yeah. he's charming you back into his circle. Yeah. Yeah. I think we have to leave it there. Is there anything you're going to say you want to add to this? No, I think that's, uh, I mean, there's all these war stories, but uh, I don't remember anything that, that uh, is really probative. I recovered it. Good. Thank you. Okay.